Disclaimer, this video contains spoilers for The Dark Knight. Are we all set? Fantastic. Now here we go. Batman begins had wowed both critics and audiences with its stark new take on the caped crusader, with many critics even saying that it was the first time they'd really managed to connect with Bruce Wayne on the big screen. But despite the critical success, the fact that the movie wasn't a runaway financial success left prospects for a sequel up in the air. Even Christopher Nolan wasn't sure if he was going to come back. He wasn't sure what story he would tell in the second movie, despite placing the tease of the Joker at the end of movie one. But the fan base was practically begging for a sequel, for a continuation of this version of Batman. Plenty of questions hit the internet as Batman fans were left in limbo, left to merely speculate about what the sequel might hold. Will Christopher Nolan continue his Batman story? Will Batman Begins get a sequel? And perhaps most importantly of all, who is going to play the Joker? This final question rocked the internet in the year following the release of Batman Begins, as plenty of rumors spread out across message boards and news articles of potential actors who might take on the part. Tons upon tons of names hit the internet, from Johnny Depp to Crispin Glover, Paul Bettany, Tim Roth, Adrian Brody, and even Mark Hamill, who had of course been the voice of the Joker for years. Later on, rumors would spread about Robin Williams potentially taking on Batman's most fearsome foe. But as interesting as these ideas were, and despite them drumming up a lot of conversation in the year after Batman Begins, none of them would come true. In fact, the name that finally emerged was one that fans and audiences never would have anticipated. Because on July 20th, 2006, articles and message boards were filled with one simple message. Heath Ledger had been cast as the Joker and fans across the internet hated this. The reception to this news was almost entirely negative. Fans just couldn't see Heath Ledger taking on the clown prince of crime. Excitement began to sink to the bottom of their stomachs. Maybe Batman Begins was just a fluke. Maybe they wouldn't catch lightning in a bottle a second time. But there were some who were more hopeful. There had of course been other comic book movie roles that were filled by completely unpredictable actors just fine. So perhaps Heath Ledger, known for Brokeback Mountain and A Knight's Tale, could surprise audiences and deliver a great performance. Christopher Nolan, of course, had complete faith in Heath Ledger. In fact, Heath Ledger's name was in the ring for the role of Batman in the first movie, but the actor had no real interest in taking on that kind of movie. But after the release of Batman Begins and its critical acclaim, Heath Ledger saw what Christopher Nolan was going for, and he himself asked if there was a spot for him in the film's sequel. After early conversations between the two hit a stride, the time came to make the news official, and despite the early negative buzz, fans became willing to wait out, interested to see where this partnership could lead. And all of this led to the official announcement of the sequel to Batman Begins. Up to this point, the movie was made up of smoke and mirrors, but now it was confirmed. Christopher Nolan was back to direct the sequel, Christian Bale was confirmed to return as Batman, and Michael Caine was confirmed to return as his trusty butler, Alfred. This time around, Batman Begins screenwriter David S. Goyer would only be in charge of the story, working directly with Christopher Nolan. But after that, the screenplay duties were taken up by Christopher Nolan and his brother Jonathan. Together, like they had done with Memento and The Prestige, they'd work with the story by David S. Goyer and tell the next chapter of this Batman's life. Legend, a next chapter that was also given a title. Just a huge week for Batman fans all around. And it's a title that would break from the conventions of all of the previous Batman movies, because for the first time, the word Batman would not be in the film's title. Instead, the movie would be called the Dark Knight. Obviously in reference to one of Batman's many monikers. And with the film officially slated for release on July 18th, 2008, the machine began to get moving as audience anticipation really began to grow. As it turned out, the Joker wouldn't be the only adversary that Batman would face in his second outing. Just like Batman Begins, the caped crusader was going to go up against a couple of his famed rogues gallery. While there were plenty of rumors for potential actors that'd take on the Penguin, those slowly 
fizzled out as audiences realized that the Penguin wasn't going to be in the movie. But a character who was going to be in the movie without question was Harvey Dent, Gotham's district attorney who would eventually evolve into supervillain Two-Face. Though most publications stated that the Two-Face side of the character wouldn't be seen until the third movie, there still needed to be someone to fill Harvey Dent's shoes in movie two. Plenty of actors' names were in the ring for Harvey Dent, such as Jude Law, Lee Schreiber, Josh Lucas, and even some fans pined for the return of Billy D. Williams, who played the character back in Tim Burton's first Batman movie in 1989. But ultimately, none of these actors would take on the role, as audiences would learn as the clock turned to the year 2007. Because it was here that it was announced that Aaron Eckhart would take on Gotham's district attorney. With plenty of press and interviews about whether or not he'd actually be seen as Two-Face during the second movie's runtime. Meanwhile, as the year got underway, it was confirmed that while Gary Oldman and Morgan Freeman would return for the sequel, there was one actor that would not be back for round two, and that was Katie Holmes. Around the release of Batman Begins, there was a lot of press surrounding Katie Holmes and Tom Cruise, and it was reported that Warner Brothers believed this to hinder Batman's box office performance. Katie Holmes' performance as Rachel Dawes was also a common criticism of the movie, and it was also reported that Tom Cruise pulled her out of the sequel for this very reason, or at least an adjacent reason. Regardless of the true madness that happened behind the scenes, Katie Holmes was out, and someone else needed to be in to continue the story of Rachel Dawes and The Dark Knight. The rumor mill got to work, with plenty of names floating around like Rachel McAdams and Emily Blunt, until eventually it was Maggie Gyllenhaal who took on the role. Both of these casting announcements were met with positive reception, and they were eventually joined by newcomers Eric Roberts, Nestor Carbonell, and others, all of which led to the start of principal photography on April 13th, 2007, where the cast and crew would unite in Chicago to film the highly anticipated its sequel. With cameras now rolling, fans began to peer across the internet to find any glimpse they could at the upcoming movie. Most specifically, they wanted to catch a glimpse of one character in particular. They wanted to know what the Joker was going to look like. Obviously, Heath Ledger's casting was controversial, but the first big test was to see how he was going to look in costume. And while fans would ultimately get a first look at the new Joker, it didn't quite come the way they expected. As fans would soon discover, The Dark Knight would have a bit of fun with its promotional efforts, leading to a year-long worldwide alternate reality game, or ARG. The team behind The Dark Knight enlisted the help of 42 Entertainment to create a viral marketing campaign, and they were responsible for the I Love Bees viral marketing campaign for Halo 2. And this campaign would be something that would drip feed information to eagle-eyed fans through carefully planted clues across the world. Things began with the official launch of the website thedarknight.com, which featured nothing more than the bat symbol on the front page. But it didn't take long for people to realize that if you clicked on the symbol, you'd be redirected to ibelieveinharveydent.com, featuring a campaign banner for the one and only Harvey Dent as played by Aaron Eckhart. But that wasn't the only thing, as a comic book store employee in Southern California discovered that Joker cards had been found across the shop, featuring the phrase, I believe in Harvey Dent too, which quickly led people to the website bearing the same name. It was almost the same as the previous Harvey Dent website, but this time it was defaced by the Joker. And at the bottom of this page was an email submission form. For those that submitted their email, they'd participate in the next phase of the reveal, enter a single X and Y coordinate. That might not seem like much, but with each coordinate that was entered, a pixel on the defaced Harvey Dent image would change. And after enough emails were registered, enough coordinates entered, finally the entire image was changed to reveal the first ever look at Heath Ledger as the Joker. A lot of the press leading up to this promised that the Joker was going to be scarier and a lot more intimidating than he had been in some previous iterations. And if this image was anything to go by, by, it looked like they were on the right track. But the image was only online for a short amount of time, as suddenly the website was left almost entirely blank, save for page not found hidden in the corner. But fans soon found out a little more under the surface, discovering blacked out text that revealed the Joker's hysterical laugh across the entire screen, complete with various letters that didn't fit with the larger laughing idea. Assembling these letters completed the phrase, see you in December, promising fans that this campaign would continue, and that there'd be more to uncover as the months went on. 
But the Joker wasn't the only character that fans would catch a glimpse of as filming continued, as eventually Warner Brothers released the first new photo of Batman, revealing that the caped crusader would take on an upgraded look after Batman Begins. It looked high tech, it looked sleek, and perhaps most importantly, it looked like Batman would finally be able to turn his head. Now ain't that a concept. And all of this came in conjunction with the announcement that the Dark Knight would film select sequences with IMAX cameras. In fact, the Dark Knight was reported to be the first ever feature film to use IMAX cameras. While the advent of 3D was slowly beginning to creep its way back into public consciousness, Christopher Nolan was instead going to focus his attention on IMAX, the biggest screens around, and he was going to use the biggest cameras for four select sequences to maximize the use of these enormous screens. But the exact specifics on what would be in these scenes was a little hard to come by, as like the first movie before it, the crew of The Dark Knight took great pains to make sure that as much of the movie was kept behind closed doors as possible. Obviously, the big action moments outside would be caught by onlookers, with even the scarce set photo revealing better looks at the Joker, but overall, the production was keeping itself as tight as possible. But that didn't mean that Warner Brothers wasn't still drip-feeding information to fans across the internet, especially at the end of July when Comic-Con came roaring around. While The Dark Knight had no actual presence at the event, with no panel of any kind, Warner Brothers still managed to make this one of the most talked about movies during the entire weekend, thanks in large part to the continuing viral marketing campaign. Across the entire convention, jokerized $1 bills were found as part of the convention's currency, like actual dollar bills that were being traded around, just jokerized. These dollar bills led to the latest website, WhySoSerious.com, which featured a vandalized Uncle Sam with a countdown and a meeting place outside of the convention center for what the Joker referred to as tryouts. For those who were following along, they united at the designated location at the right time, they'd look to the sky, and they would find a phone number written directly above them. And when this number was called, fans would hear a voicemail from a hostage, no doubt being kept by the Joker himself. This hostage would give them the next clue, inside joke. This phrase could then be entered back into the Why So Serious website, leading fans to realize that this was only the entry point into a much larger event. Across the day, the attendees at Comic-Con were taken on a merry chase around the area to follow the Joker's clues, to uncover his secrets. This involved further riddles, further locations, and even meeting one of Joker's representatives, giving him the correct password, then taking on the task of painting their faces in the image of the Joker, becoming his latest followers. For every clue, a new challenge, a new location, but none of it was in vain. At one step of the process, fans were suddenly treated with an all-new official image from the movie, a picture of the Joker threatening Rachel Dawes with a knife. But that was merely a taste, because upon finally completing Completing all of the Joker's challenges, following his entire scavenger hunt across the area, fans were given a great gift to reward them for their struggles. Because on the second day of Comic-Con, July 27th, 2007, those who completed the scavenger hunt were able to bear witness upon the very first teaser trailer for The Dark Knight. I knew the mob wouldn't go down without a fight, but this is different. They've crossed the line. There isn't much to this teaser, merely a reveal of the Batman logo, with dialogue from the movie setting the stage for the arrival of an all-new villain. But while the two voices heard at first are Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne and Michael Caine's Alfred, a third voice would emerge as the Bat logo slowly began to tear itself apart. And this third voice sent waves across the fanbase, as it was their first taste of the new voice for the Joker. Starting tonight, people will die. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> These 60 seconds completely dominated the conversation at Comic-Con, as fans had now gotten their first taste of this next Batman adventure, and they were more excited than ever. With all this slow outpouring of information, fans were consistently let in on little bits and pieces of this movie. There was rarely a dull day for Batman fans as the clock continued to tick through the year. 
And this was especially true in August, as audiences managed to catch a glimpse at the movie through one of its biggest stunts. While there had been reports of a truck flip in downtown Chicago, later in the month production turned to the old abandoned Brax Candy Factory in Chicago, redressing it to be the Gotham General Hospital. And since the old building had been defunct for quite some time, the production saw fit to blow it up. In one swift motion, the entire building went up in flames and engulfed the entire area in fire and black smoke. No one knew the exact context for the scene, but the spectacle was unmatched, and seeing it in an IMAX theater in 2008 became a must-have prospect. There was some unfortunate news for the production, however, because in September of 2007, after production had concluded in Chicago, special effects technician Conway Wycliffe was tragically killed during a test run for a vehicle stunt in the movie. Plenty members of the crew and even the studio wrote statements wishing their prayers to the friends and family following the tragedy. All the while, they saw fit to continue filming in the final weeks of production, which took a rather unexpected turn. While most of the movie filmed in Chicago, the clear stand-in for Gotham, the final stretch saw Batman do some crime fighting in... Hong Kong. Following in the footsteps of Batman Begins, the Dark Knight was going to explore this world beyond just the city of Gotham, with scarce set photos and reports detailing what was described to be a heist sequence. All the while, as fans were being drip-fed any information they could find from the set, the viral marketing campaign began to heat up once again. Before Halloween, this image appeared on the website whysoserious.com, and over the following days, fans began to notice that it was slowly rotting away. Until finally, on the day of Halloween itself, fans were led into the Joker's latest challenge. This challenge brought fans across the United States, sending them out to various locations in nearly every state to take pictures of specific letters that would be arranged as part of the Joker's next message. The hunt was on. Following the Joker's 49 clues, fans across the country went searching for every single letter. And eventually, once all clues were collected and every letter was submitted to the site, a sentence could be made, revealing the message, the only sensible way to live in this world is is without rules. A clear moniker for the Joker, allowing fans to get another taste of his twisted psyche. Ultimately, in November of 2007, production on The Dark Knight came to a close after its brief stint in Hong Kong. But just because the cameras had been put away and post-production was in full swing, that didn't mean the slow drip-feeding of information was gonna stop. In fact, it meant that the flow of information was gonna start getting more intense than ever, starting with this Empire Magazine cover giving the absolute best look at the Joker yet. Full costume, makeup, the whole shebang. The viral marketing campaign especially began to heat up in November and December. After completing the 49 clues, fans were directed to the website Rory'sDeathKiss.com, where the Joker gave out another challenge. The Joker employed his most loyal fans to dress up like him and take pictures of themselves in front of as many landmarks as possible across the world. The best pictures would be rewarded with deliveries of more clown masks and even special notes from the Joker himself, until eventually every participant was mailed a copy of the first issue of the Gotham Times, bringing people directly into the world of Gotham. That newspaper then led fans directly to the email address humanresources at whysoserious.com, which is where the Joker would reveal plenty of his upcoming clues. That led fans to the Step Right Up challenge on whysoserious.com, wherein fans would go on a carnival-themed scavenger hunt specifically to pick up cakes from 22 bakeries across the country. But these weren't just any cakes. These cakes had cell phones buried inside, which would be useful for future clues. But that was only part of the reward, because participants were also greeted with the first official poster for The Dark Knight, revealing graffiti in both the visage of the Joker and of Batman. Batman. But even then, the poster wasn't all that participants got their hands on, because they were also given one of the greatest rewards they could possibly think of. 
Upon registering onto the Pair of Jokers sub-website on WhySoSerious.com, participants would be led to five IMAX theaters across the country. Yes, only five, but these were five special theaters. Theaters that would fulfill the promise back in May that fans would see the Joker in December. Because these five IMAX theaters were the first to show the opening six-minute prologue to The Dark Knight. That's right, for those eager participants who'd been following every clue, every insane challenge by the Joker, they were now able to see the greatest piece of Joker propaganda out there, the very beginning of the Dark Knight, before anyone else. The scene details a heist sequence where all the robbers are wearing clown masks and all of them were hired by none other than the Joker. But of course they're all frustrated that the Joker himself isn't taking part in the robbery, yet still wants to take a cut of what they're about to steal. He thinks he can sit it out and still take a slice. I know why they call him the Joker. And over the course of the scene, as the heist plays out, each and every one of the members kill each other to remove a slice of the pie. More money for the rest of them, right? No, no! Backed by a pulsating Hans Zimmer score, the scene brings the tension pretty much immediately. The events unfold in a super thrilling way, as one by one each of the robbers are taken out of the picture, leaving only one single survivor, the one robber we've been following the entire time. And right at the end of the scene, it's finally revealed that this robber is the Joker himself. I believe. Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. Couple it all with stunning IMAX footage, and this scene managed to rock viewers to their bones. And soon enough, the scene was opened up for the entire world, as it soon began to play in IMAX theaters everywhere in front of the movie I Am Legend. The only disappointing part of it, as humorously noted by reviewers at the time, is that this stellar sequence was followed up by the movie I Am Legend. The pre-show kind of wound up upstaging the main event. But this six minute prologue was only a part of the sudden uptick of promotion at the end of the year because only a few days after the IMAX opening hit theaters, audiences around the world were suddenly treated to their first glimpse of real footage. For those that couldn't journey to IMAX theaters, this was all they could hope for. As finally, on December 17th, 2007, Warner Brothers released an all new two minute trailer for The Dark Knight. See to them. You're just a freak. Like me. And this trailer is packed to the brim with insane imagery, tons of great little moments, some fun dialogue, it really has it all. Action, spectacle, a tiny taste of the sense of humor that will continue from Batman Begins, and of course, it was the single best look at the Joker yet. Batman fans combed over every inch of this fast-paced, energetic trailer, eyeing Batman's new gadgets like his bat pod, as well as glimpses of the twisted and dark story the Joker was going to take the Caped Crusader through. All of it just looked incredible. Now that's more like it, Mr. Wayne. All of this marketing made one thing crystal clear. The Dark Knight was easily the most anticipated movie of 2008. And at the same time, thanks to these incredible first glimpses of Heath Ledger as the Joker, fan opinions had completely turned around. Where once there was concern, now there was nothing but thrill. With even some of the most notable voices in Hollywood sharing their excitement for this new take. Even Mark Hamill joined in, stating that he was incredibly excited to see this all new interpretation of Batman's most iconic villain. The character looked menacing, psychotic in all the right ways. All it took was seeing it in action for fans to turn around and say, this might actually be great. The countdown had begun. Batman fans were now ready and waiting for the imminent and yet unbelievably far away July 2008 debut. The Dark Knight was on its way, and fans couldn't wait. Let's put a smile on that face. <laughs> Thank you. 
As the year 2008 got going, an unexpected tragedy shocked the entertainment industry around the world. On January 22nd, Heath Ledger was found dead in Manhattan. The news came out of nowhere as the entire industry was halted in their footsteps. Plenty of people in the industry paid their respects to Heath Ledger, often citing his plentiful and diverse performances across all of his movies, with his most notable one up to this point being Brokeback Mountain. Christopher Nolan also paid his respects to the late actor, telling stories of their working relationship on set and having nothing but positive things to say about the actor, his performance, his work ethic, and his interest in the larger workings of the movie beyond him. Himself. It was clear that the entertainment industry had lost an immeasurable talent, and it was a loss that had permeate the industry as his last films released over the course of 2008. Not the least of which was, of course, The Dark Knight. While fans were already immensely interested in his take on the Joker, a whole new dimension was added following Heath Ledger's passing. And in response, Warner Brothers' marketing efforts were going to take a bit of a shift in the months leading up to release. While most of the marketing before this had almost entirely focused on Heath Ledger's Joker, now that aspect would be toned down a tiny bit to instead liven up other aspects of the movie, not the least of which was Harvey Dent. 2008 was of course an election year in the United States, but instead of focusing on all of that real-world political stuff, Batman fans could spend the early months of 2008 focusing on fictional politics. As the ongoing viral marketing campaign shifted to focus its attention on the election of Harvey Dent as Gotham's new district attorney. It all started on IBelieveInHarveyDent.com, where you could sign up to begin the fight to save Gotham. But that was only the tip of the iceberg, because the viral marketing campaign here soon became something of an entire alternate world in which Batman fans would inhabit. Fans discovered no less than 35 websites dedicated to various aspects of Gotham City, from Taxi sites to newspaper articles, the world of Gotham was becoming a lived-in place that fans could interact with and explore day in and day out. Then came the component that would take place out in the real world, where Harvey Dent campaign buses would be seen across the country, people could wear buttons, stickers, anything that they were sent to show their support for Gotham's new district attorney. All of this effort made the fanbase an active participant in the story of Gotham City prior to the release of The Dark Knight. They weren't just fans of Batman excited for this next movie, they were now citizens of Gotham, an active part of the ongoing world. The viral marketing also led to the reveal of a handful of new posters at the end of April. First up was this theatrical poster featuring the tagline, Welcome to a World Without Rules. It's ominous and dark, and it was later followed up by individual character posters for Batman, the Joker, and Harvey Dent, all of whom were seemingly being built up as the three most important characters in the story. Rumors and potential confirmations also led to the idea that Harvey Dent would transform into two Two-Face during the movie's events, with even reports of the movie using any and all modern filmmaking technology to create the effect. But while fans were pretty certain that Two-Face was going to make an appearance at some point in The Dark Knight, they weren't going to catch any glimpse of him just yet. The rest of the movie was still up for grabs, however, as early in the month of May, Warner Brothers released the second full theatrical trailer for The Dark Knight, all to help skyrocket fans' excitement as the summer movie season began. Where do we begin? Across another two and a half minutes, this trailer expands even more on the spectacle this movie will offer, but especially it dives into the deeper story this sequel is going to tell. Further expansions into the complicated relationship between Bruce Wayne and Rachel Dawes, further glimpses of the highly anticipated Joker, but where this trailer expands the most is with Harvey Dent. While there is no full glimpse of his Two-Face persona, there are definitely hints. One shot sees him lying on the ground with gasoline pouring over the floor, a Another sees him holding a gun with noticeable burning scars down the middle of his face. Harvey Dent was soon becoming one of the most interesting aspects of this story, as this trailer focuses on him in more ways than it does anything else. That is, except for the Joker, obviously, still the selling point of the entire movie and still looking as menacing and as frightening as ever. And here we go.
With little over two months left until release, The Dark Knight was easily the most anticipated movie of the year. Other blockbusters were going to have their fun, but The Dark Knight was going to shake things up once it hit theaters in July, and fans were more eager than ever. And in the final two months leading up to release, fans were treated to an onslaught of TV spots, posters, every piece of marketing went absolutely insane in the final stretch. And of course, there was a final piece of the viral marketing campaign, which was in full swing in the final weeks leading up to release. And it all led to fans being able to watch six specialized Gotham City news reports detailing the characters and story ideas all leading up to the events of the movie. Hosted by Mike Engel for some of the episodes, and Lydia, Phil, and Jerry and others, it allowed fans to get an introduction to the characters and ideas that would be prevalent throughout the events of the movie. From one featuring the new mob boss Salvatore Moroni, to to a special episode all about the election and inauguration of Harvey Dent, followed by an interview with Harvey Dent, detailing his plans to help Gotham in its time of need. There was even a brief cameo from Bruce Wayne, who was asked who he'd vote for in this ongoing election. I don't know Harvey Dent. You know, and I, I try to stay away from politicians, though, you know, you never know what you're going to get with those guys. But if anyone is for abolishing the speeding ticket, they got my vote. And then, the sixth and ultimately final video saw the GCN shocked with breaking news of a bank heist that's just occurred. And what bank heist would that be? The same one that was seen in IMAX back in December. Meaning that these news reports had caught up and synced to the beginning of the Dark Knight itself. All of which rounded out a year-long, insane viral marketing campaign that would go down as perhaps one of the greatest marketing campaigns of all time. Encouraging interactivity, investigation, all all sorts of stuff to bring the fan base together in their collective excitement for Batman and his entire world, and allowing their cooperation to unveil plenty of key pieces of information like the first Joker image, the first teaser trailer, the first screenings of the IMAX opening scene. It also allowed fans to be participants in the story, uncovering information and little hints to what the movie would entail. It was rewarding, it was ambitious, and it's something that fans involved wouldn't soon forget. But with it being rounded out, the collective thought of fans around the world centered on one single idea. The Dark Knight had now arrived. The wait was finally over. The movie had hit theaters and it was time to experience what Christopher Nolan had cooked up this time. Which left one simple and immensely important question. Would the film be any good? After all of these months of anticipation and excitement, what would have happened if the movie was bad? How would fans have reacted? Luckily for them, the early reviews coming out of the movie in the early weeks of July were absolutely stellar. The very first review, as written by Peter Travers, sent waves across the internet with the opening line, A thunderbolt is about to rip into summer movies. Anticipation had reached a fever pitch as the time had finally come. After years of anticipation, Christopher Nolan, Christian Bale, the entire team was back, bringing new friends along with them to tell this all-new story about the Caped Crusader. The time had come to experience this new story, to see what the filmmakers had done with Two-Face, and most importantly of all, to see Heath Ledger's haunting performance as the Joker in full. The clock had now turned to July 18th, 2000. It was now time to pop over to theaters, grab a bag of popcorn, and experience the most anticipated movie of the year. It was now time for The Dark Knight. As promised, this movie kicks off with a six-minute heist sequence introducing the Joker. And it is every bit as thrilling now as it was back when it debuted in December. In fact, it might even be more thrilling now. Because while its first showings were followed by a completely unrelated movie, this time out, the sequence was followed by The Rest of the Dark Knight. And so, instead of being a teaser, this was a plate setter, a tone establisher, and a way of giving audiences their first taste of the Joker as they begin to embark on this new story. 
and so begins an absolute monster of a movie. Across two and a half hours, Christopher Nolan takes audiences on a massive roller coaster unlike any other. Approached as both a reflection on modern terrorism as well as being one of the most inventive and influential superhero films of all time. One could argue that The Dark Knight was, and perhaps still is, Christopher Nolan's best movie. The momentum carries it from start to finish. It's a constant exercise in escalation as the stakes get higher and higher and the tension grows stronger and stronger. It's a bleak movie. Outside of the first 20 minutes, there isn't a whole lot of humor. Instead, the movie deals with its ideas head on. As Batman goes up against his most fearsome foe, the Joker. A foe that wishes to bring chaos to Gotham. A foe that is essentially chaos incarnate. All he needs is a little bit of a jump start and the city will be his for the taking. Bolstered by an absolutely stellar performance by Heath Ledger, this version of the Joker is terrifying at every turn. There's something deeply unsettling that Nolan and Ledger have tapped into here. For one thing, there's a concerted effort to not humanize this character. There's no secret identity, you never learn his real name, you never learn his his backstory, he often talks about the scars on his face, and on a couple of occasions he tells a story about how he got him, but every time he tells it, it's a different story. The Joker is a force of nature, a hurricane in Gotham that will not stop until he's dead and buried. Which leads to this thrilling game of cat and mouse as Batman and the Joker vie for control of the city. All the while, as the movie progresses, the stakes get higher and higher as the Joker's schemes become more and more intricate and intense. But at the same time, these schemes aren't necessarily part of some larger, intricate plan. He's not here to steal some artifact or claim some prize from within Gotham. He is simply here to cause chaos. I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things. This is a character who has no real aim. No real agenda beyond just wanting to see things explode. I think Alfred is the one who says it best. Some men just want to watch the world burn. This version of the Joker is deeply unsettling. He doesn't crack many jokes. Instead, his entire character is based around causing destruction and chaos because he finds it hilarious. He is not intimidated by Batman. In fact, there are multiple points where he wants Batman to kill him, all in an effort to break the one person he's having the most fun with. Part of this movie's whole thematic conceit is dealing with the unintended consequences of Batman showing up in Gotham. Sure, he might be able to get the mob off the streets and bring Gotham Gotham out of its cycle of apathy, but crazier beings will emerge from the woodworks to elevate the stakes to an insane degree. And that's what the Joker is all about. The ultimate foil for Batman. A foil that is entirely fueled by Batman's existence. <laughs> I don't, don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? Go back to ripping off mob dealers? No, 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 you, you complete. Me. Overall, in a movie filled to the brim with tons of fantastic moments and big accomplishment, there is nothing more triumphant than the Joker himself. Bolstered by the portrayal by Heath Ledger and the deeply unsettling ideas this character represents, this version of the Joker quickly made his mark to become one of the greatest cinematic villains of all time. I mean, he even knows close-up magic. But the Joker doesn't immediately have free reign to bring Gotham to its knees. He's got to convince the mob to pay him to take out Batman. If you're good at something, never do it for free. So before the Joker gets the keys to the kingdom, let's at least see how Gotham is operating right now, shall we? A bit of time has passed since the events of Batman begins. Everyone knows about the Batman, he's patrolling the streets, the bat signal is sending criminals running home scared. Hell, even the Scarecrow is still up and about, at least for a bit, as the introduction of Batman here sees him finally taking the Scarecrow down. But there's something this movie does that's very interesting and rather unexpected. Despite this being the second movie, movie, it is already presenting the idea of Bruce Wayne one day hanging up the cape and cowl. Unlike a lot of superhero stories, this one makes plain that Batman is not going to be around forever. But who is going to keep inspiring hope and help rebuild Gotham into something better than ever? Well, that's where Harvey Dent comes into play, often referred to as Gotham's White Knight. 
The new district attorney is eager and enthusiastic, having put a dent into organized crime in Gotham already. He's a hero with a face, something different from Batman the Masked Vigilante, which makes him the perfect candidate to take over after Batman inevitably disappears. All of this is bolstered by a pretty great performance from Aaron Eckhart. He's light, he's fun, he has the dry wit that works wonders in this movie, and he's got plenty of great lines. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. He's also dating Rachel Dawes, Bruce Wayne's still kind of current love interest. And this time, given the fact that she's played by a different person, she is a bit of a different character from last time. This time around, Rachel Dawes isn't quite as idealistic. She has a bit more cynicism about the world around her, but is also willing to fight for what she believes in. Sometimes literally. Not to mention the entire through line that once Bruce Wayne finally hangs up the cape and cowl, he believes that the two of them will be able to have a future together. It's kind of what he's hanging everything on, despite the whole Harvey Dent thing complicating matters. Bruce, don't make me your one hope for a normal life. Regardless, it's a through line that brings out more of an emotional side to Bruce Wayne, even in a movie that is very grim and very bleak. A movie that centers entirely around the battle for Gotham. A Gotham that is quite a bit different than it was last time. Where Batman Begins saw plenty of different corners of Gotham, with a massive train going over the city streets, an island in the middle of the city called the Narrows, all sorts of stuff that harken to the more fantastical side of this world, The Dark Knight doesn't do any of that. Gotham City here is... Well, it's just Chicago. There's no fancy window dressing, there's no fantastical locations, the Narrows is nowhere to be seen. This is just another big American city. A far cry from the incredibly fantastical nature of Gotham in the four previous movies. But it also works in favor of the movie's themes. In tackling the ideas of modern terrorism, those kinds of topics wouldn't hit as hard in a fantastical location with big statues everywhere, as cool as that looks. Instead, it makes it all the more terrifying to believe that this is a real city that is going to be bent and twisted to the whims of the clown prince of crime. But Gotham City isn't the only place we visit in this movie either, as Batman takes a brief trip to Hong Kong for a quick and exciting action scene, which shows off some more of the IMAX footage, following in the footsteps of the bank heist from the beginning. In fact, the advent of filming and distributing this movie for IMAX specifically changed a lot of the way that Christopher Nolan and cinematographer Wally Pfister shot the movie. When you look at Batman begins, most of that movie is framed as close-ups or medium close-ups. You hardly see anything wider than the shoulders up kind of thing. But when you blow that up to the massive IMAX screens, which Batman Begins was when it first released, you find that some of those close-ups just become too close. Audiences would wind up only looking at one singular eye or one single part of a face instead of viewing the whole thing. So, even in sequences that weren't shot in IMAX for The Dark Knight, the cameras are pulled back quite a bit. The shots are wider, we see more of the area around the characters, allowing better use of these absolutely gargantuan screens. Now, you might be asking, why is Batman in Hong Kong? Well, this guy, Mr. Lau, has taken all of the mob's money and hidden it in a location that only he knows. And in order to evade the Gotham police, he's gone to Hong Kong, where he won't be extradited by the Chinese government. So, Batman's gonna break a couple of laws and snatch him up to bring him back to Gotham to use him as leverage against the mob. He even uses this sonar technology that Lucius Fox gave him to be able to map the area without anyone knowing about it. That sounds simple enough, right? Snatch the guy and bring him back to Gotham? It even works. With Lau in Gotham PD's custody, he's able to help them arrest Salvatore Moroni and his entire collection of friends. Thanks to Batman, Jim Gordon and Harvey Dent are able to put away half of the city's criminals, half of the city's organized crime. Look at that. They've managed to bring a bright spot to Gotham, a sense of hope. The only problem is, actions have consequences, which is what the first act of this movie is entirely dealing with. Because now that the mob have been brought to their knees by Batman, they're finally desperate enough to hire the Joker. Escalation. A word used in the final scene of Batman Begins which tees the Joker is one of the central ideas of this entire movie. Things start small. One fake Batman is killed, but it comes with a threat. Batman must take off his mask and turn himself in. Oh, and every day he doesn't, people will die. Starting tonight. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> 
One death on the first day, then on the next day two more are killed, including the commissioner of the Gotham Police Department. Then there's two more the next day, which comes with the threat that his next target is the mayor of Gotham. With barely any time, the Joker is slowly but surely turning the people of Gotham scared, turning them as fearful as can be. All of which works exceedingly well with Christopher Nolan's expert cross-cutting. Nolan and his editor Lee Smith employ a tactic that wasn't seen a ton in Batman Begins, but is used to great effect here cutting between several scenes as they play out simultaneously. Not only does it give the scenes an innate sense of momentum, but it allows the Joker to feel like he's in multiple places at once. The death of Commissioner Loeb and Judge Cirillo are cross-cut together in a way to maximize the tension as the information is slowly drip-fed to the audience until the ultimate conclusion. It also helps that Gotham feels like a living and breathing city at every turn. We see tons upon tons of secondary players across the city. Of course, we have our major characters like Alfred, Lucius Fox, Jim Gordon, but added to this movie are GCN host Mike Engel, the mayor Anthony Garcia, even lawyer Coleman Reese, who kinda sorta stumbles onto the idea that Bruce Wayne might be Batman. There are characters and people around every corner, so we see the city that the Joker is impacting, the people that are affected by his constant attacks. Which builds to a rather harrowing funeral for Commissioner Loeb, where the Gotham police force are well aware of the threat against the mayor's life and have set up as many precautions as they can. But we soon learn that those precautions aren't enough. And not just because suddenly an attack commences, but because of the score. Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard employ a very simple and very effective motif for the Joker. It's not even something you could really define as a musical theme, it's more of an ominous, eerie tone. And yet, any time it plays in the movie, it feels like the Joker is suddenly in control. And boom. There he is, in the last place the police would expect, as he turns his gun to kill the mayor, but Jim Gordon tackles him out of the way and takes the shot himself. That's right, in a move to shock audiences around the world, Jim Gordon dies. Man, I liked him. He didn't even get to make Commissioner like he always does. But it's the exact death the movie needs to kick Bruce Wayne into gear. Or, more accurately, out of gear. As this is the moment he decides to hang up the cape and cowl. To reveal his identity to stop the Joker's rampage across Gotham. Couple it with a nice setup and payoff of Alfred saying, I told you so, and you have both an emotional scene as well as something that hits a nice bit of humor in an otherwise bleak moment. I suppose you're gonna lock me up as well. As your accomplice. Accomplice? I'm gonna tell them the whole thing was your idea. But revealing your secret identity is not as easy as it sounds. Despite the fact that Iron Man ended with Tony Stark revealing his identity only two months ago, the same fate is not waiting for Bruce Wayne, as instead Harvey Dent is the one that takes the fall. I am the Batman. It's actually a pretty clever ploy. Harvey Dent uses this opportunity to put a target on his back to lure the Joker out, all so that when Joker makes his attack, the real Batman will show up and finally take Joker down once and for all. Leading into what might be one of, if not the best sequence of the movie. Following in the footsteps of Batman Begins, the Dark Knight sees Batman take the tumbler for another spin through the streets of Gotham in this massive chase sequence. Coupled with excellent practical effects, tons and tons of little moments, it's a deeply thrilling chase sequence, and that is helped in part by the music. Or rather the lack of music, because for most of the sequence, there is no score. There is no rhythmic, pulsating Hans Zimmer action music playing in the background like there is in tons of other places in the movie, or even the chase in Batman Begins, which helps this particular sequence a ton. The only soundtrack is the actual sound effects. The lack of music gives the whole scene an eerie feel to it. It increases the tension. Instead of it just being a thrilling and visually exciting action scene, it becomes something so much more right with tension and unease. But there is the occasional bit of music, most specifically in the moment where, after the tumbler takes a pretty nasty hit to protect Harvey Dent, Batman unveils his latest toy, the Batpod. Goodbye. 
and this thing is just so cool. Not only is the reveal awesome, but it has so many tricks up its sleeve. Not the least of which, and probably my favorite one, is the fact that the wheels can spin sideways for Batman to take sharp turns and slide across the road. That's just so cool. And the whole sequence comes to a head in one of the most breathtaking practical effects ever put to film, the truck flip. Just like Batman begins before it, Christopher Nolan once again applies the trick of no matter how many shots you have during the sequence that are faked, as long as the last one is real, the whole thing lands. And boy does this thing land. God, that stuff just rules so hard, dude. Can we... Do you mind if I play that again? Just one more time? Yeah, let's, let's play that again. Oh, it's so good. And it's not even the final surprise in the sequence, because after Batman tumbles off his motorcycle, the Joker has the upper hand. That is until... We got you, you son of a bitch. Jim Gordon, everybody, he's back. He faked his death, he's alive, and it all comes together to capture the Joker once and for all. A big set piece, great effects, and it all comes together in a twist reveal that sees the villain finally captured. What a great climax. And we're only an hour and 22 minutes into the movie. So we got quite a bit left here, don't we? Firstly, we have an absolutely incredible interrogation scene between Batman and the Joker. A whole scene where their conflicting moral ideals come head to head. And not in a big fist fight, no. It's all in dialogue. It's all in their conversation. Even if Batman tries to make it more of a physical confrontation, the Joker isn't biting. Because he wants Batman to kill him. It's a scene that crystallizes both sides of this conflict, and sees them go head to head in an incredibly thrilling way. Way. But it's a scene that also, once again, escalates the stakes. Not necessarily in physical scope, but more in a personal sense. Because during this scene, the Joker reveals his next scheme. He reveals that both Harvey Dent and Rachel Dawes are hooked to explosives at two separate locations. Their clocks are running out and the Joker's going to make Batman choose which one is going to live. This might arguably be one of the more recognizable superhero movie tropes. I mean, think back to 2002's Spider-Man, where Green Goblin forces Spider-Man to choose between the woman he loves and a trolley full of kids. And the ultimate expectation and the result of that scene in particular is that the hero somehow manages to save both. And so, Batman and Gordon split up to get to work, rushing to each of the locations. Batman heads to Rachel's location while Gordon and his team head to save Harvey Dent. This is where that deep, pulsating Zimmer score comes into play. In another masterful play at tension, the music builds and builds, as does the cross-cutting. As once again, we cut between Batman and Gordon racing to their respective destination, Harvey Dent and Rachel Dawes talking to each other over the phone as they realize the predicament they're in. This scene even sees Harvey fall onto the floor as gasoline leaks around him, covering half of his face. And finally, there's perhaps the most thrilling side of all, we see the joke Joker back at the cell staging his own breakout. And it's not a simple breakout either. The guy had a bomb planted inside of another dude's stomach. And once he got his legally requested phone call, he set off the bomb, blowing through the whole place. That's not something you just whip up while you're inside the cell. That's something you prepare for in advance. Meaning, the Joker planned to get caught. He wanted to be locked up, all so that he could get to Mr. Lau, the man with all of the mob's money. After pulling a big twist with Gordon's survival, audiences were completely caught off guard by this immediate follow-up twist. But that's not even where things end, because once Batman arrives at Rachel's location, he busts through the door to find... Once again, that low hum of Joker's eerie motif plays over this scene. He is in control, having swapped the two locations. But Batman arrived in time to save Harvey. Does that mean Gordon and his team arrived in time to save Rachel? Some you could hear a pin drop during this moment. The expectation going in is that Batman has to find a way to miraculously save both people. But here, he barely even saves one. 
It's perhaps one of the most shocking moments in the entire movie. Rachel Dawes, the supposed love interest that you'd think would last the entire trilogy until she and Bruce Wayne got together, ends up dying in movie number two. To add insult to injury, before she died, Rachel Dawes wrote a letter to eventually be given to Bruce Wayne when the time was right. A letter that revealed that she was never ultimately going to end up with Wayne, and that her heart belonged to Harvey Dent. While this letter isn't given to Bruce immediately, we as an audience know its contents, and we know that Alfred knows its contents. It's perhaps one of the most emotionally powerful series of events in the entire movie. All cards are on the table. Rachel is dead, the Joker is hit Batman right where it hurts, and more importantly, he's hit Harvey Dent right where it hurts. You've likely heard it said that this movie sees Batman and the Joker fighting for the soul of Gotham City. And that is true, especially in the last 45 minutes. But where that struggle hits the hardest is the fact that they're also fighting for the soul of one man, Harvey Dent. Gotham's White Knight, who put half of Gotham's criminals behind bars, who was going to be the beacon to light the future of Gotham, has been burned half to hell. He was going to be the one to take Gotham into the future, the one to prove that Batman was no longer needed. And the Joker took him and tore him down. The Joker turned Harvey Dent into Two-Face. And it was here that after months of speculating, audiences finally got to see the full effect for the very first time. I'm sorry, Harvey. No. No, you're not. Not yet. Oh, look at that. What a haunting effect. You can see the tendons running across his face. You can see the bone beneath the burned flesh. The eye is completely exposed. And the press surrounding this movie wasn't kidding when it said that this movie would use all the tricks at its disposal to create this effect. Unlike the Tommy Lee Jones Two-Face from Batman Forever, which was entirely prosthetic, the Two-Face here utilized CGI. There was still some prosthetic, which helped Aaron Eckhart feel out this character and take on a new new persona separate from the Harvey Dent that was seen at the start. But for the rest of his face, tracking markers were put in place, but not ordinary tracking markers as the lighting was too dark to actually be able to photograph and use the tracking markers like they would anywhere else. Special tracking markers were made that then reflected light that was invisible to the eye, but could be captured by a secondary camera in sync with the main shooting camera. Line up the tracking markers and boom, you've mapped Aaron Eckhart's face to accurately graph this burnt and horrifying look for these scenes. Just an excellent effect all around. But even with Harvey Dent's face burned away, the Joker isn't done escalating his plans, as the next major sequence sees Coleman Reese, that lawyer from earlier, attempting to reveal Batman's identity to stop the killing. But we've just learned that the Joker is having so much fun with Batman, so he now wants to keep Batman's identity a secret for his own enjoyment. So he entrusts the entire city of Gotham to kill Coleman Reese to maintain the secret identity. If Coleman Reese isn't dead in 60 minutes, then I blow up a hospital. Every character is now on the move. Jim Gordon is tasked with protecting Reese. Officers are split up across the city to evacuate every hospital in town. And Bruce Wayne decides to drive out to help protect Reese as well. Will you be wanting the back pot, sir? Middle of the day, Alfred. Not very subtle. The Lamborghini, then. Much more subtle. It's another excellent sequence that crosscuts between several ongoing stories as the clock ticks down through the allotted 60 minutes. We have Jim Gordon trying to protect Reese, we have Bruce Wayne trying to do the same his own way, and of course we have a scene where the Joker talks to Harvey Dent in the hospital. Not only does this reveal a great deal about the Joker's whole modus operandi, but it also begins the lingering motif of Harvey Dent's following actions. Throughout the movie, Dent's carried a coin, a coin that he flips to decide what he's going to do. But it's not really a matter of chance, as both sides of the coin are the same. But now, after the bombing, one side of the coin is scarred, just like him. And now he really will leave his actions to chance. More specifically, he'll leave the fate of others to chance. The only twisted bit of fate here, though, is that this particular coin flip results in Harvey sparing the Joker's life. Just can't win at all these days. At the very least, though, Coleman Reese's life has been saved by Bruce Wayne nonetheless, so that's fun. 
But the Joker is a man of his word, and after 60 minutes have passed, he pulls the trigger to blow up Gotham General, which leads to one of the most spectacular effects ever put to film, an effect which doesn't happen immediately, leading to this brief improvised moment from the Joker where he's a little disappointed in the explosion. But all swiftly changes course as the entire building winds up going up in flames. Just an amazing shot all around, and the fact that it's entirely practical brings a whole other layer to it. It's just such an impressive and awe-inspiring effect, and it proves once again that the Joker will always make good on his promises. Which means that after all of these events that have taken place up to this point, the battle for Gotham's soul lies solely with the Joker. He has complete control. Which leads Batman to a point of desperation, enlisting the use of the sonar technology from earlier to try and track down the Joker Joker once and for all. Now, you might be thinking that that's a little dodgy. I mean, using people's cell phones to map the entire city of Gotham? That's just elaborate spycraft that can be used for so many evil things. And you'd be entirely correct in thinking that. And the movie is kinda sorta on your side. At the very least, Lucius Fox is on your side. With half the city feeding your sonar, you can image all of Gotham. This is wrong. The dodgy spy politics aside, at least the movie is presenting a side of the argument that is entirely against the use of this technology outside of this insanely high-stakes scenario. The Joker must be found, and this is the only way Batman knows how to do it. I'll help you this one time, but consider this my resignation. As long as this machine is at Wayne Enterprises, I won't be. When you're finished, type in your name. But at the very least, it does give Batman his iconic all-white eyes for the final battle, as he is able to utilize the sonar technology live to see things he wouldn't normally be able to see. Which is all incredibly useful in the final stretch of action, as Batman slowly makes his way up this under-construction building to reach the Joker so he can take him down once and for all. But it's not just a simple smash and grab to take out the Joker, because this final stretch also reveals the Joker's latest scheme. After all of the escalation from one dead person to two to the death of Rachel and the destruction of a hospital, everything has led to this. Gotham is Joker's city, and anyone who doesn't want to be a part of it, they'd better get out now. But as the Joker warns, they better not get out via the tunnels or bridges. That'd be a bad idea. Are the tunnels and bridges rigged to blow? Regardless of if they are, it's smart not to leave that up to chance. Which leads to this singular shot, a big wide shot of the people of Gotham trying to leave the city, with the bridges closed off for bomb searches. With this one singular image, we understand that the Joker is in control. He's laid out a threat and the entire city has responded, because they believe that he'll stick to his word, no matter how terrifying that word is. Which leads to perhaps the most thrilling sequence in the movie, both in terms of stakes as well as the moral questions it raises. As with the tunnels and bridges out of the question, the people begin to ship out of Gotham by ferry. And with paranoia even reaching the likes of Jim Gordon, he decides to load some of the ferries with the prisoners locked up by Harvey Dent. Can't have them be part of whatever the Joker's planning, which leaves two boats on the water. One filled with civilians, the other filled with prisoners. And this just so happens to be exactly what the Joker wants, because it's revealed that both boats are rigged to blow. But it's not a simple matter of the Joker pulling a trigger and destroying everyone. There's a far deeper moral question that this entire scene raises. Because both boats have been given a detonator, but not to their own bomb. They've been given the detonator to the other boat's bomb. The people on either boat now have a choice. Before midnight, one boat must destroy the other in order to survive. If neither boat is gone by midnight, they're both going up in flames. Oh, and you might want to decide quickly because the people on the other boat may not be quite so noble. Cross-cutting comes into play once again as Batman slowly but surely makes his way to the Joker's location. All the while, we see the people inside both boats as they try and figure out exactly what they're gonna do. The power that this scene holds cannot be understated. It's not just that the stakes are high, but it's also that they're believable. If the threat was that all of Gotham would be detonated, it wouldn't hit quite as hard, because we'd know that Batman would somehow be able to thwart it, like he did in the first movie. But since the stakes purely 
revolve around these two boats, it's still absolutely terrifying, but it's not out of the question that one or both is going to blow. Then there's the added thought that the audience is most definitely wise to the Joker's trickery by now. So there's the possibility that he's lying through his teeth and the two boats have the detonator to their own bomb, not the other's bomb. But perhaps more powerful than any of that is the fact that most everyone who's watched this movie has put themselves in the shoes of the people inside the boat and asked themselves, what would I do? Would I pull the trigger to save my own skin? Or is that a bridge I won't cross? Add on to the fact that one boat is filled with prisoners who've arguably had their chance and squandered it, does that make it easier to pull the trigger and blow them up? It's a moral conundrum that the Joker has placed onto the boats that can extend even to the people watching in the theater or at home. And that is the power of movies to its fullest degree. You get to enrapture yourself in this high-stakes situation without ever leaving the comfort of your chair. And the tension builds and builds as Batman slowly but surely reaches the Joker, the clock ticks closer and closer to midnight. Who's going to pull the trigger first? Which boat is gonna go? It seems at one moment one of the prisoners is gonna take the detonator and do what the guards can't. He's going to hit the button. Give it to me, and I'll do what you should have did ten minutes ago. The prisoners are gonna blow up the civilians. Brace for it. Or he'll do that which leaves us with only one possibility left. The civilians are going to blow up the prisoners. One of the more vocal civilians stands up, grabbing the detonator. He was all for blowing up the other boat to survive, and now here he is with his finger on the button. The tension builds as the only musical track is this high-pitched, screeching tone that stretches over the entire moment until... And that is the ultimate kick in the teeth for the Joker. After all of his attempts to bend the city of Gotham to his will, at the 11th hour, the people of Gotham essentially told him no. Neither boat destroys the other, which opens the opportunity for Batman to finally take the Joker down, throwing him off the building, catching him with his grapple, and hanging him off the side. Through a harrowing series of events, Batman has managed to finally get the one-up on the Joker. The events of the movie have proven that Gotham is willing to believe in good, and that the soul of the city will never fall into the Joker's grasp. It's a message that even through the hardships of the entire movie, the harrowing sequence that preceded this moment Gotham and society as a whole are still well worth believing in. But despite the big scale of that scene, that wasn't actually the climax of the movie. Because as we've discussed, the battle for Gotham ultimately centers on one man in particular. Despite the Joker's seeming defeat following the two boats, he still had one ace in the hole. His ultimate gamble. He broke Harvey Dent in a way that will shake Gotham to its core. If the people of Gotham discover the true nature of Harvey Dent, the city will be completely lost. As the Joker Joker puts it, their spirit will break completely. See, madness, as you know, is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> <laughs> During this entire stretch of action, Harvey Dent has been on a killing spree, flipping his lucky coin to see whether his targets will live or die. His targets? Everyone who is even remotely responsible for the death of Rachel Dawes. Which leads to the final scene of the movie where our three central hero characters, Batman, Jim Gordon, and Harvey Dent, converge. Dent has Gordon's family hostage and his young son at gunpoint, all to fulfill the promise from earlier that once Gordon has felt the same pain that Harvey has, only then will he truly be sorry. The scene is small scale, it centers on our three main characters, and it deals specifically with the arc of Harvey Dent, from respectable DA to mass murderer. But despite its small scale, it is perhaps the most heart-pounding scene in the entire movie. Everything has escalated to this, where Harvey is set to point the gun at both the people responsible for Rachel's death and at the spirit of Gotham as a whole. You first. He flips a coin for Batman, it lands on death. 
He flips again for himself. It lands on life. And finally, he is ready to flip the coin to decide Gordon's son's fate. All the while putting Gordon through the same terror that he was in when Rachel died. And once Gordon is at his most vulnerable, at his most desperate, Dent flips the final coin and... <laughs> Oh, thank God. Batman saved the day. He saved Gordon's son. He kind of killed Harvey Dent and ultimately managed to end the conflict. But that's not quite a victory, is it? Harvey Dent was Gotham's White Knight. Now, not only is he dead, but he killed several people in the lead-up to this moment. As soon as this information gets out, then all of Dent's prisoners will be let loose. The city of Gotham will lose all of its hope, and the Joker will have won. You reveal this info, and then you do the two-boat scene? One of those boats is gonna blow up the other, no question. And that's when the Joker wins. But the Joker can't win, as Batman so eloquently states. Which leads us into the final scene of the movie, where all of the thematic ideas presented by Christopher Nolan, Jonathan Nolan, and David S. Goyer are crystallized. Batman is going to take the fall for dense murders. I killed those people. Batman is going to become the bad guy. As Alfred stated several times before this, Batman can be the outcast. He can be the one to make the hard choice that no one else can make. And it ultimately leads to the infamous line by Gordon, Because it's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one it needs right now. Harvey Dent's reputation is able to survive, the Joker's plans are ultimately thwarted, and through a cross-cut montage, every disparate thread comes together. Lucius Fox types in his name, ultimately destroying the sonar machine monitoring Gotham. Alfred burns the letter from Rachel, and Batman runs off into the distance, taking the fall to save Gotham. He's a silent guardian, a watchful protector. Dark Knight. And with that title slam, the entire movie clicks into place. Every thematic idea comes together, and you suddenly realize that the title doesn't just allude to Batman's many monikers, but it relates to the kind of hero he is. Harvey was Gotham's White Knight, a hero in its purest form. And Batman is something far darker, something potentially more morally questionable. Batman is... The Dark Knight. What a movie. Critical reception to The Dark Knight was absolutely phenomenal. Critics almost across the board gave rave reviews for nearly every aspect, from the effects to the characters to the action sequences, and most of all to Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker. Fans were equally delighted, as this movie's release managed to unify them in a way that few other things had. The Dark Knight was perhaps the greatest Batman movie ever made. And the box office also reflected that. While Batman Begins had a more tepid box office response, that fate was completely out of the question for The Dark Knight. This movie stormed onto the scene in a massive way. It opened with a record-breaking $158 million over its first three days, becoming the biggest opening weekend of all time. And over its run, the movie dominated the summer, being the biggest movie of both July and August 2008, destroying all competition to rake in an astonishing $533 million domestically and $1 billion worldwide. The Dark Knight became the first ever Batman movie to crack a billion dollars at the box office, and thus became the most successful movie of the entire franchise. Not only that, but The Dark Knight also also became the fourth movie ever to crack a billion dollars, following in the footsteps of Titanic, Return of the King, and Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Man's Chest. For those that questioned whether or not Batman was truly revived after Batman Begins, they weren't questioning anything anymore. The Dark Knight took over the world. But it wasn't just critics, audiences, and the box office that heaped praise on the movie, because once the clock turned to 2009, plenty of award shows lent their praise to tons of the movie's greatest aspects. Even the biggest film award show, the Oscars, nominated The Dark Knight for tons of awards. But to the ire of fans, the movie was not nominated for Best Picture. While it would have gone up against some other heavy hitters, the Academy was criticized for only including five movies in the Best Picture category, something that they would rectify in the years following The Dark Knight's release. 
Despite being snubbed for Best Picture, however, the movie did take the award for Best Supporting Actor, posthumously awarded to Heath Ledger for his haunting performance as the Joker. Accepting the award on his behalf was his father, his mother, and his sister, who all paid words of tribute to the late actor, honoring not just his performance as the Joker, but his entire career and the legacy he was going to leave behind. The Dark Knight would ultimately become one of the most influential blockbusters of the 21st century. Not only had plenty of people ranked it among their favorite movies of the year, but plenty of the tropes and tricks utilized in this movie were homaged or straight up copied by other movies in the years that followed. Plenty of movies would begin to ape off of Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard's deep and pulsating score, reboots like The Amazing Spider-Man would take from the darker tone, and perhaps most of all, movies like The Avengers, Skyfall, and Star Trek into darkness would ape the whole bad guy gets himself captured on purpose trick that the Dark Knight pulled off so well. The Dark Knight is a movie that has gone down as not just one of the greatest comic book movies of all time, but one of the greatest movies of all time. Every piece of this puzzle just works, and it's one of the rare movies that gets better with each subsequent rewatch. Christopher Nolan and company had nailed something special with this movie, and it wasn't long before fans began to clamor for the team to return to the franchise to capture capture lightning in a bottle for the third time. But would Christopher Nolan return to round out a trilogy? Would the story be able to continue without Heath Ledger? Would Batman return for one final adventure? I guess, like all things, fans would have to wait to find out. Until then, they would be able to relish in the success of The Dark Knight and be able to relive the thrills over and over again, to ride off with Batman into the unknown. 